Well, again, this evening we're returning to uh, Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. Uh, this evening we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 16, Lord willing. So let me read those for you now as we begin. Jesus, in his prayer to his Father, says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now, we saw this morning uh, Jesus prayed for his disciples that as he was leaving, the Father would protect them. And I think specifically from three things, or at least there were three things within this uh, petition. First of all, that he would preserve them uh, in general and bring them safely to heaven. In other words, that he would do everything that was necessary eventually to bring them into glory, keeping them in the Spirit of God in union with one another and eventually to enter into that union that they would enjoy with the Father and the Son in heaven. So again, the idea is preservation, that the Lord would watch over them and keep them. Secondly, that he would protect them from the evil that is in the world. And then thirdly, that he would protect them from the evil that is in their hearts. Now, we, we just looked at the first this morning. We're going to look at the second this evening. And this evening, what I'd like us to do is simply consider uh, three things. Uh, first of all, again, from this text, we see the mission that Jesus gave to his disciples and he has given to us. Jesus has sent us into the world. We see, secondly, the danger that the world will hate us. And then thirdly, the solution, which is not removal from the world, but rather refuge in God. Now, first of all, let's take a look at the mission. Jesus has sent us into the world. Now, it may not be immediately apparent, but that's what Jesus is saying in verse 14. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, Jesus gave them his word basically for two reasons. He gave it to them originally so that they might be saved. Now, it's interesting with regard to the disciples because they were already a part of the Old Testament church. And many of them may already have been regenerated, may have already been converted when the Lord Jesus Christ first called them to be his disciples. In other words, they were Old Testament saints. For instance, Peter and John and Philip and Andrew believed what God said in his word and they were looking for the Messiah. And when, you know, when, when Jesus actually had found them, and of course, uh, since they were already his people, they may have already experienced something of that transformation that would cause them to be estranged from their neighbors, at least in some degree. I mean, it happens in all circles, doesn't it? When you see somebody who's really zealous for the truth, it tends to be convicting, and that's going to be something we're going to look at that is going to be even more pronounced in the difference between us as believers and the world. But it's also true that there was at least one person that Jesus called that wasn't converted until he called him, and that was Matthew, uh, the tax collector. But one thing we know for certain, that once he did call them, they were all alienated from their neighbors. That's because this call of Jesus put them in a different relationship to the world. I think what Jesus meant for the disciples primarily by the world were the people around whom they were living, not the world as we think of it, although it was similar in many ways because many of the Jews were unconverted and uh, we live among a uh, majority of people who are unconverted. Well, we're going to see what that, how that works out in just a few moments. But the second reason that Jesus gave them his word, why he saved them by it, was that they might become his ambassadors. 
to take his gospel to the world. Jesus spent three and a half years with these men, teaching them, preparing them, entrusting to them uh, the greatest treasure that anyone could ever possibly possess in order that they might take this treasure and share it freely with the world. Now, we do need to see God's Word as a treasure. It's kind of commonplace today. It seems like most people in the world have a Bible, and we, we know the Gideons, again, have done a very good job of putting Bibles everywhere. But we do need to understand that the Bible itself and the truth it contains is actually given to the church. It's given to the people of God, and it is a treasure which is entrusted to us. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 and 14. Retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Now, again, the Lord has entrusted His Word to us. It is a treasure, but He has done this for a specific reason, and that is that we might share this Word with others. Now, again, there is a difference between the disciples' relationship to this call and our relationship to it. We don't have the same calling that the disciples had. None of us here do. Uh, we're not all called to be preachers. We're not all called to be evangelists. We certainly aren't apostles. We do believe that that particular office uh, uh, was passed away with, with the apostles themselves. But we do have our Lord's call on our lives to be His witnesses and to share His gospel with others. Now, the disciples took this responsibility, they took it seriously. And they did what they were called to do, and they actually did it quite well. They took the gospel to the world. As a matter of fact, um, you know, we know that all the apostles were involved in this. Certainly when we look at the book of Acts, it, it showcases the work of Peter and Paul in particular. But they did the work, and the gospel was brought to the world. Now, in God's mercy... That which began in Jerusalem, that which began in Israel, that gospel which basically had its birth there through the work of the disciples and those who came after them in God's mercy eventually came to us and by His grace we were saved by it. In His love the Lord brought us into His church and He taught us and He entrusted this treasure to us. And by His authority, He also called us in order that we might share His gospel freely with the world. And just as Jesus gave that gospel to us without charge, freely, so we are to give it away to as many as we can. I think you see that emphasis shot throughout the gospels. That's what Jesus did. Uh, his example we are to follow, as, as at least as we can within our particular callings, and we see His disciples wherever they go sharing the gospel. When Jesus said, well, sent His disciples out, He said to them in Matthew 10, verse 8, freely you have received, freely give. Now, the Lord has given His commission to His church as, as a whole. I mean, this isn't just you know, my responsibility, not just your responsibility and just ours as a small fellowship. But this is the responsibility of Jesus' church as a whole. But even though it is given to the church as a whole, each of us has our particular part to play. In, in the words of um, I, I want Horatius Bonner, or was it either Horatius or, or Andrew Bonner in, in the uh, preface to uh, Gilly's historic accounts of revival, he basically pictures us as those who are uh, awake among those who are sleeping. Uh, we are the ones who have our eyes open. We are the ones who see the danger. We are the ones who are already in the place of safety. And we are the ones who have basically the information to help others reach that place of safety. We have the truth that can save that can save our neighbors, that can save our friends, that can save our loved ones from sinking into that hell which the Bible tells us is real 
and true. And so we need to share this message. That's one of the reasons why the Lord gave us His Word. It was to save us, but it was also that we might share it with others that they might be saved. Now, so that's first of all the mission. The Lord has sent us into the world, and we do need to understand that that does involve all of us. But secondly, we see the danger in bringing this message to others. Jesus says the world will hate us. Again, we see this in verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, the problem that the disciples had to face was basically a bunch of angry unbelievers. And we have that same issue, that same problem. The reason why Jesus prays for us is because He knows that our audience is going to hate us. The word there, hate, uh, in the original language literally means detest, which I think flows from our understanding of the word hate. Now, they will hate us because as we do what Jesus called us to do, it will become clear to them that we are different than they are, that we are not of the world. Jesus says this in verse 14, but He also says it in verse 16, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. Now, we're not of the world because of God's grace, right? We started out the same as the rest of the world did. We started out as a part of this world. We were born into this world, the children of Adam, like everyone else. We came into the world guilty of Adam's sin and so condemned, but we also came into this world with an evil heart. And of course, because of that, for a good part of our lives, we live just like the rest of the world. We were the children of this world. Paul writes in Ephesians 2 verse 3, and he includes himself in this, among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. We were a part of this world. But at some point, God in His mercy saved us through faith in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He took us out of the world, not in a physical sense, but in a real spiritual sense, and brought us into His kingdom. The Bible says that now we are the children of light, living among the children of darkness. We are no longer uh, of this world, even though we are in this world. We are no longer of this world, even as Jesus is not of this world. Now we belong to the kingdom of which He is King. And of course, that means there are certain changes that have taken place in our lives. We no longer want to do what the world does, but we want to do what the Lord would have us to do. We want to be like Jesus. Now, once the Lord brought about that change in our lives, it, it happened to put us at odds with the world, even as the world was at odds with Jesus. Remember what Jesus said earlier in John's Gospel, where we looked at a very similar subject in chapter 15, verses 18 through 19. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. So we are no longer of the world. We are at odds with the world. So the world is going to treat us the way it treated Jesus. Now, at least it will if it sees that that change has actually taken place in our lives. The world won't see that difference that exists between them and us unless we do one of two things, live like Jesus and speak like Jesus, or live the life He calls us to live and share the gospel, which is really one thing, unless we do what Jesus calls us to do. Now, if we don't live as Jesus calls us to live, 
If we do what everyone else does, if we talk the way they talk, if we laugh at the same jokes, if we use the same coarse language, if we place the same value on the things they do, value on, on money, value on, on popularity, value on position, if we disrespect authority, break the Sabbath, commit sexual sin, steal, backbite like the rest of the world, then they're not going to see any difference. And of course, if they don't see any difference, they're going to treat us like they would treat anyone else. They will love us like they love the world. And of course, they'll do that because if that's the way we live, <laughs> then we are a part of the world. We're not really a part of God's kingdom. We still need the Lord's mercy. But if we show that we're different, if we stand out, if we live the way that the Lord calls us to live by letting our light shine in such a way that they may see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven, if we begin to do what Jesus would do if He were in our situation, then they will see that we're not the same and they won't like us. As a matter of fact, they will even hate us, particularly if what we're doing happens to rebuke them uh, for something that they're doing that is wrong. Jesus tells us in John 3.20 that those who are in the dark hate the light, and when the light shines from us, they're going to hate us. You know how it is when you're around other people and they're doing something you don't think it's right, and so you, you basically distance yourself and you're not going to do it. They immediately begin to you know, accuse you of being holier than they are. They begin to hate you because you're different, but particularly because you're wanting to do what's right and they don't want to do what's right. The darkness hates the light. So that's one way that they will recognize us and begin to hate us is when we stand out by living a different kind of life. Now, the other way that they're going to know that we're different is by the message that we bring to them, the message of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and repentance from sin. Now, they're particularly going to hate us for this, and this is, I think, one of the main reasons why we tend to hesitate in sharing the gospel with others is because, and also of living the kind of life Christ calls us to live in front of others is because no one enjoys being hated by others. I do want you to understand, and I'm speaking to myself as well, we don't have any other options. Jesus does not give us any other options. We must do these things. We must live the life He calls us to live. We must share this gospel that He has given to us. We have a command from Jesus to do this very thing. He says in Mark 16, verse 15, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And again, we may not necessarily as individuals be called to do this. This is a work given to the church. Uh, but we do need to do it where we are. We have His Spirit in our hearts that, that moves us, that compels us to obey the Lord Jesus Christ because we love Him and because we know that what He is calling us to do is the right thing to do. We have the love of Christ in our hearts that moves us to reach out to those around us whom we know will perish forever if they do not hear the gospel. We do know that if someone, anyone, does not repent and believe, that they will perish. We know that if they don't, and we know them, that one day we are going to see them again among the goats, on the day of judgment, and we are going to see them in a condition that is not going to be pleasant, trembling with fear as God pronounces judgment on them, shrieking in, in terror as the Lord sends them forever into the lake of fire. That's something we're going to see. There's a hymn that we often sing that, that talks about that, but from another perspective. When I see the wicked call on the rocks and hills to fall. When I see them start and shrink on the fiery deluge brink. In other words, when I see them about to be cast into the lake of fire. And that's something that we will see. 
for trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see people we know that are going to end up in that lake. He says, then, Lord, will I fully know, not till then, how much I owe. You see, we know that that's going to happen. And we know that there's something that we can do about it, not then, then it's too late, but there's something we can do about it now and only now. We have a message that we can share with them, which if the Lord is pleased, He will use to save them. I mean, we, we know that there is such a thing as salvation. We know there is such a thing as, as damnation. If we have trusted the Lord, we know how happy we are that we've been saved from that judgment. Uh, we need to try to reach them as well. Love dictates that we try. Jesus says, love your neighbors, you love yourself. You don't want to perish in the lake of fire. I don't want to perish in the lake of fire, so we should try to reach them with the gospel. Now, they're not necessarily going to love us for telling them the truth. They might actually hate us for it, but it's the only way that they can be saved. You can't just love them into the kingdom of heaven with good deeds. You know, it's, they're not just going to look at you and say, oh, now I understand the gospel. Uh, you need to tell them the message, and it's really quite simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. So, again, we see the mission. The Lord has given us His Word that we might share it with others. We see the, the danger, the difficulty we have to face. The world's going to hate us for doing it. But finally, we see the Lord's solution to the world's hatred, to our particular dilemma, to the fears we might have in reaching out to others. And the solution is not removal. <laughs> the solution is refuge. The solution is protection in this world that we stay here but the Lord protect us. Jesus prays in verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Now, Jesus could have asked the Father, Lord, take these who have trusted in me now to heaven. Like Elijah, send down your fiery chariots and, and convey them all to glory. But that's not what the Lord did. The Lord could have taken us straight into glory the moment we believed. Then we would be safe, absolutely safe. But you see, that wasn't the Lord's purpose. He left us in this world because we have a work to do. Uh, as you might uh, imagine, it would be difficult for us to evangelize from heaven. We have to be here in this world among the people that the Lord has called us to reach. God has determined that the gospel would be the means to save, and He has also determined that those who are saved by the gospel would be those who would share that gospel with others. So the answer then to the world's hatred is not that the Lord would remove us out of the world, but rather that He would protect us from the world, from the evil that is in this world. Jesus prays that the Father would do so. Now, remember this morning, we already saw that he prayed that the Lord might preserve us and bring us to heaven at last. And that really incorporates everything that we're going to see as he unpacks this. Well, here he prays more specifically that the Father would protect us from evil. If you look in your Bibles and you look at that particular passage where it says, but to keep them from the evil one, the word one there is in italics because the word one is not really uh, in the original language and it's supplied because the translators believe this is referring to Satan and certainly that could be the case. It's really not specified. He simply says the evil by which he could mean all the evil that we're going to have to face in this world, which includes the people who have evil hearts. It includes the world itself, which not, you know, not the planet and all the beautiful things we have to go look at in Yosemite and things like that, but rather what John tells us about in 1 John 2.16, which is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. It's, it's those plus the evil one, okay? He could be referring to all the evil that we have to face in the world, or he could mean more specifically the evil one himself. After all, he is the one who is the main enemy. 
He is the one who works through the hearts of those who belong to him, who are in his kingdom, the people of this world. He's the one who's working in the world system through these particular things. And we'll look a little bit more at those next time when we consider the fact that Jesus prays that we would be protected from ourselves, from the sin that's in our hearts. He's also, of course, the one who is at work personally in this world along with his army to try to stop us from doing what the Lord has called us to do. So Jesus could certainly be referring specifically to him because he is the mastermind. And actually, he does a pretty good job of intimidating the church. So what are we to do in the face of all this evil as Jesus sends us out to bring the gospel to a, a people that are going to be uh, antagonistic are going to be uh, re you know, resistant to this message. How can we avoid the fear that we would experience? Well, Jesus prays for us. That's the answer. And we know that what He has prayed, the Father has heard, and the Father has answered His prayer. Now, if that is true, if Jesus really has prayed for us and the Father has heard His prayer and the Father is going to do what He has asked, why should we still be afraid of the evil if we have the Father protecting us from that evil? Well, the answer is we shouldn't be afraid. Instead, we should have the attitude of the psalmist who writes in Psalm 118, verses 6 through 9, the Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Now, if we can just learn to do this, if we can just learn to trust in the Lord, if we can just simply look to Him by faith and know that He is our refuge and that He's not going to let any evil ultimately harm us, we really don't need to be afraid of anything. But you see, that's exactly why Jesus prayed for us, so that no matter what the evil one would do, through all the means that are at His disposal, through the people of this world and through all the things that are in this world, and even when, if He should confront us personally or one of His demons, He would not be able to harm us. He would not be able to stop us. Uh, Jesus, remember, is praying this prayer because, because, you know, after He leaves, the disciples have a job to do. And he knows they're going to have to face these things, and he knows they need this kind of encouragement, and they need to find the strength and the courage to be able to do it. Jesus is going to provide it. He's going to provide it through this prayer. Remember, he prayed these words in their hearing so that his joy would be made full in them, so that they would know he's praying for them, so that they would know that he has made provision for them. That is one way. The other way is by giving us the spirit of power which, again, is a part of what Jesus is praying for here. The Spirit of God who is going to be the other comforter and the one who would come and give them the strength they needed to do this. So let's also be encouraged by this prayer because this prayer was not just for them. This prayer is also for us. Let's trust Jesus. Let's believe that His Father will provide this gracious protection. Let's be reminded that He has given us His Holy Spirit to give us this courage, it is there and we can appropriate it and we need to because it's the only way we're going to be able to find the courage we need to get the gospel out to those whose lives depend on it. It's the only way we're going to be able to overcome our fears and actually reach out to them. So may the Lord give us the grace to do that. Let's bow in, in a moment of prayer and um, let's pray that God would would grant us that grace.